Today I want to share with you some wonderful vintage cookbooks that I recently found at our community library sale. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest. I'm a former New York City girl, but I live the simple life now with my sweet husband here in the Texas Hill Country. And here on my channel, I show you how to find joy in living simply by cooking from scratch, making home remedies, and creating a cozy home. So if you're like me and you want to live the simple life, be sure to subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now I am going to talk about cookbooks. However, if you will just indulge me this one book because you know I love dogs and I have to share this book with you. It's James Herriot's Favorite Dog Stories. Now I have the larger version of this that's the children's version that has a lot of pictures but uh, so we already have this book and the stories and it's been well loved and I've read every story in it to my son when he was growing up and when we were homeschooling, we really enjoyed it. Uh, but when I saw this little version of it, I just had to get it. And I don't know if, you know, James Harriet, obviously, you know, the veterinarian uh, who is very well loved and uh, all, you know, wrote All Creatures Great and Small and many books that followed that. Uh, this dog stories book that whether you find this one or the larger one, uh, that's the real children's version. I mean, these are definitely appropriate for children, but the, the large version has pictures. And I'll, I'll have to go get that and I'll, I'll show it to you. But this is such a wonderful book. These stories, I love James Harriet, and what's so nice about these stories is that if you want to read uh, James Harriet to children, and you don't want to, you know, read the the whole large book that he had, you know, all creatures great and small, all things bright and beautiful, all things wise and wonderful, you know, all wonderful books for the for children to read, you know, when they get a little older. But if, if you have really young children and you want to introduce them to James Harriet. I highly recommend his dog stories where they've just been broken into uh, little little books here. And our favorite story in, in, within dog stories is Only One Woof. To this day, my son is a grown man now, to this day, my son and I still talk about Only One Woof. And if you know the story, you know how touching it is and, and what I won't give the, the plot line away, uh, but it, you have to read this story and children love it. It's just a beautiful story and this is just a delightful book. Every story in this book is wonderful, but if you love dogs and uh, if you have children and even if you don't, if you just love dogs and, and, and you don't have children, um, You'll love the story, Only One Woof. And here is the larger uh, book that I was talking about that I've had since when my son was young. And what is so funny, I just pulled this off of my bookshelf and there's a bookmark in it. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you, it's right at Only, Only One Woof. We read this story so many times. <laughs> And the bookmark is there. That's funny. But this is just, if, if you can find this book, if you are reading to children or even for adults, I and mean, I love this kind of stuff. I have so many children's books and I, even though my son has grown and obviously I'm not homeschooling anymore, uh, I kept so many of them because I just love looking at them from time to time. The illustrations are so beautiful in some of these older books. But, uh, and I'll put a link to, to both, I'll put a link to both of these in the description below. Uh, so if you want to learn more about them, you can. Uh, but look at these lovely, lovely illustrations. They're just, and the whole book, every page, look at this. It's just beautiful. Just beautiful. This, uh, I mean, I love, I also, you know, as I've shared with you, I love Beatrix Potter and I love her stories. Um, but I love James Harriet's stories too. And the illustrations, uh, this is by, it's illustrated by a Ruth Brown and a Peter Barrett. I mean, it, they're, they're just, they're beautiful, beautiful illustrations. Such detail and lovely soothing colors. These are wonderful, just wonderful bedtime stories. But in any event, just one woof. 
uh, or, is that, or is that only one buff? <laughs> I, I think that uh, you're going to really enjoy that. Thank you for indulging me and letting me talk a little bit about a dog story before I get into cookbooks. We have a nice little community library here in our town, and throughout the year they sell books, hardbacks, paperbacks, uh, fiction, nonfiction, cookbooks, of course you know I like that, and they sell them all year long, and they have them right when you walk in uh, the front door on various shelves there, and the paperbacks are a dollar, and the hardbacks are two dollars, and over the years I've definitely found a lot of nice books there. And then periodically throughout the year, they have a big sale where they fill a room uh, with all books that they have that maybe they had duplicate copies, maybe they didn't have room for, maybe they were older, maybe they were donated books that they just don't have room for or don't need, and they'll have a big sale. And they'll give you a bag, and you can fill up the bag for $10. So it's a real nice bargain, and you often can find very nice books. And sometimes old books, sometimes newer books, just a, a big variety of fiction, nonfiction, cookbooks, everything. Well, today they had one of those sales where you can fill up a bag for $10. So I found some books and my husband found some books and we were able to fill up a bag. And so I wanted to share with you the books that I got because I thought some of them were really quite special and I'm quite pleased with them. And the first one that I got was this book called A World of Breads by Dolores Casella. And this is a really nice book. Now, Dolores is a very interesting woman. Unfortunately, she passed away last year, but she was from Idaho, and she was the mother of five children, yet she found time to write five cookbooks. Can you believe that? And I think she wrote for numerous uh, publications, and she even had a TV cooking show. So she was quite accomplished. And she lived to be well into her 80s. I think uh, last year when she passed away, she was 87 years old. So uh, that's quite something. But this book is a really wonderful book. And it's called, a, as I said, A World of Breads. And it says, A Most Complete Guide to the Making and Baking of Good Breads in 600 Recipes from Around the World. That's fantastic there, that there's 600 recipes and from around the world. And this is a pretty common book. So I think if you look around in your travels at uh, used bookstores or library sales, like, like in my case, uh, you may very well find this if you're interested in breads and interested in baking. And I will definitely put a link in the um, comments below uh, so that to, to all the different books that I talk about. Uh, I'll put links if I can find them. Um, and I, I think I can from the selection I have. I'll put links uh, in the description below and then you can you know learn more about them and have the exact title and author you know if you're if you're looking around for them. So this book has had so many printings. This is the paperback version but it has been uh, in both a hardcover and the paperback. So be sure to keep your eyes open, you know, for one or the other. And this goes back to her, the, the hardcover was first printed in 1966. And then it had eight printings. So you know this is a good book. It had eight printings right through 1976. And then the paperback edition came out in 1974. And that had seven printings through 1981. And this particular version with this cover is the paperback version that was printed in 1981. Uh, so any book that had eight printings in a hard copy and seven printings in a paperback, you know it's going to be good. I mean, I don't... I can't think of any modern-day cookbook author that's had that many printings uh, of a book. And I want to read you the table of contents so you can get a feel for, for what's in here. But she starts with uh, what bread makers should know, uh, biscuits, muffins, and popovers, corn breads and other quick breads, loaf breads, rolls, fried breads, pancakes and waffles, sourdough breads, you know, it's a favorite of ours here, biscuits and hot cakes, baking powder, tea breads, and coffee cakes, yeast raised coffee cakes, and sweet rolls, holiday breads, and other sweet yeast breads. And then she just has a chapter, miscellaneous breads. And in her chapter on sourdough, and I think this will be a, a, interesting to a lot of you because I know we talk a lot about sourdough, uh, sourdough cornbread. 
That just sounds so delicious and so intriguing. Uh, any, you know, anything you make with sourdough. She's got sourdough biscuits, sourdough hotcakes, sourdough muffins, sourdough Italian bread, sourdough graham bread. That's very interesting where she uses graham flour, sourdough French bread, sourdough steel cut oats bread. I mean, that's the best of both worlds, isn't it? I mean, that's terrific. I mean, you just, you just don't see these things. Rice hotcakes, potato pancakes, Dutch babies, they're always fun to make. And so there's just, she's just got a lot of wonderful, wonderful things in here. She's got a whole, uh, her fried breads section that I mentioned when I read to you from the table of contents. So, uh, so many donut recipes, if you like making donuts. She's got baking powder donuts, buttermilk donuts, glaze for donuts, very important, brown sugar donuts, German drop donuts, orange donuts, sweet potato donuts. That is, I think that's just terrific. And uh, old fashioned cake donuts, brown sugar yeast donuts, French donuts. Those are really good. I've, I have to, I haven't read her recipe on it, but uh, the French donuts that I've made in the past, you, they, they don't have the hole in them. They're just little kind of these round, fabulous puffs and you roll them in um, sugar and cinnamon. Oh my gosh, they're so good. <laughs> And so it was just a lot of Hungarian donuts, you know, Portuguese. Yeah, this is terrific. So I'm really looking forward to going through this in detail and definitely baking some things from here. And I'll definitely uh, make the videos when I bake things from here so we can all learn together. And let me know in the comments below if you enjoy me uh, giving you these little uh, vintage cookbook tours of, of the various books that I find in my travels. I really enjoy it. And uh, if you do too, give me a thumbs up. I'd love to know if this is something that you all enjoy. So be sure to look for Dolores Cookbook in your travels. I don't think you'll be disappointed at all. It really looks like it's going to be a wonderful read and a wonderful book to make breads from. The next book I found is, is actually a book that I have, but I have the original version. And this uh, really intrigued me because it's the fine art of Italian cooking, you know, especially with an Italian mother. Whenever I come across Italian cookbooks, I really enjoy them, uh, reading them and discussing them with her and so on and so forth. And this is the classic cookbook, Updated and Expanded, The Fine Art of Italian Cooking. And excuse me if I... Uh, and destroy this gentleman's name, but <laughs> it's a Giuliani, uh, I'm thinking Bugiali, uh, my mother would know best, but Giuliani Bugiali, and you will see a lot of cookbooks by him. He's a pro prolific cookbook writer and really considered, you know, one of the best uh, cookbook writers, uh, you know, on Italian cooking of cookbooks that we see here in the United States. Of course, you know, Marcella Hazen's really gonna kind of hold that, uh, hold the torch. It, you know, for me is probably the best along with like Anna Del Conte and, and authors like that. But he's definitely considered, you know, quite an expert. Uh, so let me read to you uh, again the table. I like to, to give you all the table of contents so you have a, a feel for what's what's in the book, especially if you look for these online. And you know, as I said, I'll put all the links in the description below. But sometimes with these older books, you know, all they show is the cover and you can't look inside, you know, like you can, you know, on Amazon with some of the newer books. So I like to read you the table of contents so you have some idea of, of, of what the book is all about. But, you know, he starts with a preface to the second edition, you know, and all the usual stuff like that. And then he gives some historical background. That, that's interesting. And some basic ingredients and a note on equipment. Then he has a chapter on breads and pizzas. He has sauces, basic sauces, sauces for meat or chicken, sauces for fish, sauces for pasta, rice, and soups. And this is really, this is one of those cookbooks. I mean, if, you, if you're only gonna have, you know, one, Ital uh, one Italian cookbook, if you have like a Marcella Hazen uh, or a, um, a Anne Del Conte or a Giuliani, uh, Bugiali <laughs> book. And really, if you, you, you can just have one because they all, uh, they're such a definitive source. They cover everything, you know, and as you see, this is a big book. This is, 
667 pages. So it's, it's a, it's a t tome, is it the word, you know, as they say. Um, then he goes into, after sauces, he goes into antipasti. Then he does soups, broths, and consumes, minestrone, and uh, minestra, and passati. And minestra is nice. Uh, that often is, I don't know exactly how he'll describe it here, but I know, like when I was growing up, my mother would make soups and she wouldn't even actually say it with that minestra. She'd just say a minest. And it was usually like a beans and greens. And those are delicious. You make white bean soup and chop in uh, some escarole and throw that in. And it's such a simple thing, you know, really cucina povera, as they say. But, you know, simple cooking. But it's uh, uh, just so homey and so delicious. And next he goes into pastas, fresh pasta, dried pasta, stuffed fresh pasta, large stuffed pasta dishes, and a timbalo dishes. And those are, if I remember correctly, they usually, sometimes they're done like in little ramekins or something, I think. I'm going to have to look that up and research, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but it's interesting, too, he talks about fresh pasta. And I, I have to say, you know, when did this, like in the 80s, fresh pasta started becoming popular? But my mother is a real dried pasta girl. Uh, even when she would make homemade pasta, she'd always dry it because she always had this thing that, and it's so cute, it's funny, you know, I think about the things that my mother taught me about cooking growing up and the things she would say. She always had this feeling that the dough, if you, if you didn't let it dry and then you cooked it fresh, it was gonna be very hard to digest. <laughs> I know a lot of people eat fresh pasta, but we never ate fresh pasta because my mother always says, oh, it's hard to digest. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny, whenever I see things in cookbooks uh, for fresh pasta, I always think to myself, well, I'll, I'll be making it fresh, but I'll be drying it. <laughs> uh, then, then he goes on to rice first courses. So yeah, I bet you he'll, he'll have some interesting things there. And then miscellaneous first courses. And then he goes into fish, the boiled course, the fried course, eggs, poultry and game, veal, beef, and lamb, pork and sausage, variety meats, polenta, I love polenta, a composite main courses, salads, vegetables, desserts. And then under desserts, he has some subcategories, custards and creams, pastry and pastry desserts, rice dishes, and fruit desserts. And so it's, it's definitely, you know, it's a tome, as I said, and it's, it's going to cover everything. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, looking through. And I, I always enjoy in these, different, in these Italian cookbooks because even though they cover everything, they often have their own little spin on it. And like with the rice dishes, it's going to be interesting to see. It's primarily probably going to be a lot of risotto. And uh, that's a very northern, you know, Italian uh, dish. And my mom is of northern Italian heritage, and so uh, that's the rice dish that I'm most familiar with in Italian cooking and the one that, that I enjoy. So I always like to see what varieties they have. So the fine art of Italian cooking. So look for it, you know, in your travels if this is something that interests you. And the next book that I found is just a real treasure. It's the Pepperidge Farm Cookbook by uh, Margaret Rudkin. And this is a more, this is an updated uh, version. Uh, the original was written, I believe, some, sometimes in the, in the, in the 1960s. Uh, yes, this is more modern. This is 1992. And the original uh, looks like it was written in 1963. And maybe many of you, you know, might be familiar with the Pepperidge Farm Company. Uh, I certainly grew up uh, having Pepperidge Farm products in our home, and we even had a little Pepperidge Farm. Um, it was like a little, what do you call it, like a little clearance store. Uh, I don't, I don't, you don't really see them around today. But what it was was it was a little tiny shop, you know, no bigger really than the size of a, a modern day kitchen. And in that store, and it wasn't far from where we lived, where I grew up, uh, they would sell day-old bread. But just, it was a little Pepperidge Farm day-old bread shop. And I guess the bread that didn't sell in the grocery store, or maybe they had extra, I'm not really sure I was a kid, uh, would be in this store. And it, you know, 
was just a day old, and uh, my mother and I would go there, and my mother would buy the Pepperidge Farm bread, and then she'd just put it in the freezer, you know, to keep it as fresh as she could. And it was, I remember her being so happy because it was so affordable. It was marked down quite considerably compared to the price in the grocery store. So say maybe bread was 25 cents back then, I don't know, maybe this was five cents or something, but uh, she, was, she always enjoyed uh, taking me with her and going to the little Pepperidge Farm store. So I have nice memories of that. But what I find very interesting about the Pepperidge Farm cookbook is Margaret Rudkin, and I don't know if you know very much about her. Uh, if you're younger, you know, those of us who are older, you know, uh, you may know more about her. Uh, but uh, just to give you a little history, she's a fascinating woman. Uh, she was, was a mom, and her, she had a son who had asthma, and she felt that he, could, he should not be eating the uh, processed bread that was sold in the grocery store. And maybe other things too, I think she really kind of started getting on a natural path of wanting to feed him more whole foods. And this was really, you know, um, I, I'm not sure, you know, exactly, you know, what time in history that was happening. Um, I mean, Margaret passed away in the late 60s, so this was probably at the time when, you know, after World War II, when packaged foods and processed foods, my mother always called them prepared foods, uh, were becoming more popular in grocery stores. Uh, but in any event, you know, Margaret felt there had to be some better way, you know, to feed her son. So she baked a whole wheat bread. And she brought this bread to her doctor, or to her son's doctor. I don't know if it was a pediatrician or what. And he was so impressed with this whole wheat bread and how much better her son was doing that he had her sell it to all his patients. And so she became quite the little baker and quite the little businesswoman now selling this whole wheat bread. And one thing led to another, and then she was selling it through, I think, maybe a little store. And I believe all this took place in New York, if I remember correctly. Uh, but in any event, uh, Margaret uh, became quite successful and uh, opened this, the Pepperidge Farm Company. And so it was founded by a woman. And she sold her bread and then went on to sell many, many types of baked goods. And it's continued on, you know, even, even after all these years. But what's even more fascinating about Margaret? Not just to mention that she founded the Pepperidge Farm Company, starting just you know as a mom with the, her whole wheat bread and writing this cookbook. She went on to become the first woman to be on the board of directors of the Campbell Soup Company. How about that? Now this is a woman who passed away in the 1960s. That's amazing. She was really terrific. And all this came to happen was because the Campbell Soup Company purchased the Pepperidge Farm Company that Margaret had founded. So she really became quite the success in life. And it all started with a simple loaf of whole wheat bread to help her son. I just find that so sweet and so motherly because I think there are so many of us that in cooking, whether for ourselves, friends, family, that when we uh, go back to those traditional foods, which you know I have a real passion for, uh, we do these things uh, to improve health. And uh, not only our own health, but the health of our friends and our family. And it's, it's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful homey thing. And to think that this woman, you know, in the starting maybe around in the 1940s uh, with a simple loaf of whole wheat bread to help her son who had asthma, uh, went on to uh, help so many people and to really build a very successful, a successful company. Okay, well, let me get back to the book. <laughs> uh, well, what's so cute? So it's Pepperidge Farm Cookbook. And I love the, uh, the subtitle. I just think it's so cute. Homespun American Cooking. That just, I love that. Homespun American cooking with over 500 delicious recipes for appetizers, soups, breads, meat, fish, poultry, cakes, 
pies and desserts. And so now let's go into the, uh, oh, and I just want to mention in this book, uh, I'll go through the table of contents, but she writes an amazing uh, introduction all about her childhood, about growing up, about the foods and how they were prepared and what she enjoyed, what she didn't like, you know. It's just multiple, multiple pages. Yeah, it goes up 14 pages, she writes, and it's, it's really... It's really w wonderful. Uh, these type of cookbooks where people really pour their heart into it and write uh, lengthy you know, essays, in essence, in their cookbooks, uh, really make these living books. They're not just a list of recipes with instructions. Uh, you really learn about the, the person, the author who's writing them. And that's what makes a cookbook special, at least for me. Uh, it's the reading um, behind, you know, reading about the author, about the author's life, what he or she is sharing with you, and what the food meant to, to them, uh, what role it played in their life growing up or later on in their adult life, um, their life with friends, their life with family. It's just beautiful, you know, coming together around delicious food and and sharing that with other people. That's what, for me, uh, makes cooking very special. It's what makes food very special. And it's what makes cookbooks very special when, when the authors share those sorts of things. So uh, I was very happy to find this. But let me uh, just give you a little preview of all the things that are covered in here. And how Margaret has divided this book up in the table of contents, which is very interesting. I mean, this is, I got to tell you, if you find this in your travels, just grab it. Even, you know, if it's the more modern uh, issue like this one. I mean, if you find the one published in, in the 63, I think it was in the early 60s, uh, that's a real treasure. But uh, any, any uh, edition you find is well worth it. Because the way this book is divided up is part one, childhood. Part two, country life. Part three, Pepperidge Farm. Part four, cooking from antique cookbooks. Is that chapter a gem or what? Cooking from antique cookbooks. And then part five, Ireland, when she goes to Ireland. And each chapter, contains recipes relevant to that part of her life. So the recipes in part one, where she gives a long introduction about her childhood, are the recipes and the foods that she ate in her childhood. Country life, when she goes on later, um, I believe, I have to refresh all my memory when I, when I read this, but I believe when she got married, her and her husband, they, they may have moved to a little bit more of a country town. They may have bought a farm. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know, it'll be interesting to find out. Maybe did they call it Pepperidge Farm? I don't know. Uh, but cooking from antique cookbooks and the, the old books she had and how she would take recipes uh, from there, you know, to, to, to create uh, nutritious foods that previous generations had eaten because in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you know, more and more prepared foods were really being introduced, you know, into... Uh, our households, and here she is going to antique cookbooks to uh, find these wonderful traditional recipes, and then Ireland and and all the foods and recipes that you know she experienced there. So uh, definitely, I highly recommend this, the Pepperidge Farm Cookbook. If you find this in your travels grab it and I think you're going to really enjoy it and I think you're going to find Margaret a fascinating woman a wonderful writer truly what I would call a living cookbook this is this is more than just recipes if you'd like to learn more about vintage cookbooks and cooking from scratch be sure to subscribe to my channel and then click on this video over here where I tell you about a very special vintage children's cookbook and I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country home love and God bless